You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian by New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Borspuya. In this week's program, we interview Yasmin Rahman of Center for Secular Space on polygamy. We'll also be talking about the huge numbers of refugees in 2015, how satellite dishes are morally corrupt, as well as men in hijabs. Don't go away. The news this week, we'd like to focus on numbers released recently by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. The numbers of refugees are now unprecedented. It has never been so many since the Second World War. It's now 65.3 million and the statistics are unbelievable. There are about, uh, what's the numbers, 24 people every minute who are being forcibly displaced, 34,000 people being displaced every day. It is unprecedented. And this is forced displacement. There is a level of denial in this issue. And I think most of the Western societies and political elites and the international media they actually are trying to deny the reality of this fact. These are forced migration and, and people becoming refugees. This is not just normal sort of people trying to sort of move to an area as part of freedom of labor. This is forced migration. Mm, yeah, and I mean the, the rea reality of the matter is that there's a lots of factors which contribute to why people have to flee. Part of it has to do with Western foreign policy, part of it has to do with the Islamic State, part of it has to do with dictatorships like Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia and, and the Assad governments and so on and so forth. Bombings, wars uh, and, and all of these need to be taken into consideration. The fact of the matter is that people need support, they need protection. It's the, the global structure that exists and everybody's responsible for this. I think that's the thing. We can't say nothing to do with us. We don't want to know anything about it. People can stay over there and shut the borders and have policies that creates an environment that everybody's drowning on seas and being shot at at the borders. Mm -hmm. It's everybody's responsibility. We have a collective responsibility, and that's the important Definitely issue that we need to do. a moral with. collective responsibility, as well as a practical one. And not to forget that rights are inalienable. We may not recognize them as such, but nonetheless, people have a right to asylum. They have a right to protection. Recently, I interviewed Yasmin Rehman of the Center for Secular Space on polygamy and her research of six years on this issue. Stay with us and hear what she had to say. Thank you, Yasmin Rehman, for speaking to us. I wanted to ask you about your extensive research into polygamy in Britain. Can you tell us what your main findings were? Okay. I started the research six years ago. It began life as a master's dissertation, looking at um, whether or not polygamy amongst Muslims in Britain was a conducive context for violence against women and girls. In these six years, I've, I've expanded it out because I want to also look at um, other faith groups. But most of my interviews overwhelmingly have been with Muslim men, women um, and young people. I think it's a conducive context for violence, for violence against women and girls. It's abusive, um, it, it's, um, it's unequal in terms of gender. Um, when people talk about women choosing this option, I think they're choosing, and I use that word really carefully, within a framework of extremely limited options. Um, we know that it can be used um, as a means of um, engaging in child marriage, forced marriage, there is domestic violence, there is sexual violence. 
Um, there's also enforced cel celibacy, so where you have the first wife who is replaced by a second wife, she's not free to enter into any other relationships and can, can find herself in terminal, terminal um, enforced celibacy. Um, but even where you don't get physical violence and abuse, you get the emotional impact. And I've spoken to countless um, young people and slightly older who grew up in polygamous households and have spoken really movingly of this sort of sense of rejection that as their mother was rejected, so were they as children. And that, leave, that does lasting damage, so I think it's a really harmful practice. That's why I'm calling for a move away from harmful traditional practices to harmful marriage practices, which I think would fit polygamy much more, um, uh, much more easily than the harmful traditional practices do. But also it would catch, um, it, it would, I think it would catch a range of other things, but also make it easier to show the continuum between different forms of violence that occur within marriage structures. But some will say that it's just yet one more form of marriage, you know, if you defend gay marriage, for example, it's not uh, the norm, but it needs to be accepted. Some will say polygamous marriages are just something that need to be accepted. That's an argument I hear an awful lot, is that, you know, monogamy has moved on, we now have same-sex marriage. I've also heard that, okay, this is the type of marriage, one of the arguments that, that many of the men put forward to me was, well, would you prefer that I had lots of mistresses and lots of girlfriends? At least this sort of frames it within um, a religiously justified, a religiously sanctioned marriage. My response to that is I think the state has a responsibility. When, when we're talking about abuse and we're talking about harms and we're talking about denying people access to their rights, then I think the state has a role to play and has to make a decision in terms of polygamy. I think this thing about marriage is changing, of course it is, but do we then allow temporary marriage? Do we then allow child marriage? Where does it then stop? I think there is, it is absolutely imperative that we draw a line in the sand and that line should be drawn where we're considering harm or potential harm. What about uh, people who've had polygamous marriages abroad and then they come to live in Britain? That's the real area of tension, and I think that's the real complexity, is um, particularly with the Syrian context and with the refugee crisis, or with people coming from Africa, where they, they are in legally recognised marriages that have occurred in countries where polygamy is recognised. How do we respond? Because they're fleeing situations of extreme danger. If you or I were in those situations, we would want to be free of them. So I think that there is a tension between how do we manage that and how do we also ensure that traffickers don't exploit um, the, the opening up of a space for refugees to come in even if they are in legally recognised polygamous families and using it as, as a means of trafficking women through. So it's a really difficult question for which I haven't got an answer. The other issue is of course homegrown polygamy. And that I think we can deal with much more easily, but that requires political will and, um, and a robust response, which I'm not convinced that at the moment anyone is prepared to deliver. What do you think is a uh, political response to this issue, the homegrown polygamy? I think it's about registration of marriages. Um, this is actually where I think that real kind of tension between freedom to practice one's religion and gender equality and the right to life, I think, really sort of butt up against each other. There is a campaign for registered marriages, um, which I think is, you know, is admirable and it's being led by lots of Muslim groups. But we have bigamy laws. I think the state needs to take a clear stand and say that only legally recognised marriages will, will, are allowed to happen within this country. There is, there is no ta unofficial recognition um, of polygamous marriages or, you know, turning a blind eye. Now, the difficulty is with Muslim marriages is that they don't need to take place in a mosque, so registering the mosques is only part of the problem. Many nagars take place in a home or in the friend, a friend's house. I think it's then about possibly bringing in laws that impose a sanction on anyone conducting a polygamous marriage 
or conducting a, a religious marriage without any evidence of a civil marriage having taken place beforehand. Because there are monogamous marriages that are also just conducted um, as a religious marriage and those the, the, the people within that union, the man and the woman, cannot then avail themselves of the protection that the state offers people who are legally val and validly married. What about other countries? Have they been able to address this in any way that we could learn from here in Britain? There's the Customary Marriages Act in South Africa, which was, which was trying to protect people who were already in polygamous unions. And I think that's, that's a continuation for me of colonial practices of saying family matters can be dealt with through religious tribunals, religious courts or customary courts. Um, that goes some way to it. I, my, my preference is for the Canadian model which um, in 2011 upheld its ban on polygamous marriages. That, that was the result of a, um, a, a review that was, was judge-led and conducted by um, Justice Bowman, um, who was a Chief Justice in Canada at the in British Columbia at the time. Um, you know, they took evidence from all sides, but it was framed not within religious practice, but within a human rights framing. Does this practice lead to harm? Is it abusive towards women and children? I mean, we, and that was very specifically looking at the Mormon context, not the Islamic context. And in the Mormon context, you have exactly the same things playing out as you do in a Muslim context, child marriages. Um, you have young men who could potentially access some of the women, literally being thrown out of the compound and left um, at the borders. And you know, there, there's lots of research about um, the life outcomes for those young men, which, which aren't positive. So I, thi I think a clear, firm stand from, from the position of the government. In the way that we've done with forced, forced marriage, the way that we've done with honour-based violence, the way that we've done with female genital mutilation, the, the, I guess the difference with polygamy is forced marriage and female genital mutilation, honour-based violence, can all be dismissed as cultural practices. Polygamy is a religious practice. It is contained within the Quran. The Prophet... Um, Muhammad himself, peace be upon him, he, he had you know, um, 11 marriages. It is difficult to then say to people you know, um, that, that we're, we're taking a stand that this is not acceptable, but the qualification for me is, is it's not a religious edict, it's not an order. It, the Quran says you can enter into these marriages, but it's preferably to stay in one. It's not something that would limit your ability to be a Muslim if you did not have a polygamous marriage. Millions and millions of Muslims do not have polygamous unions. So, um, and there are also, I think, um, lots of reinterpretation going on. Sisters in Islam in Malaysia um, have done some absolutely groundbreaking, amazing work at looking at the harms of polygamy and trying to reinterpret Quranic texts. That's not the position I come from, although I think their work is absolutely um, it, you know, to be looked at and to be praised and to be commended. But I think taking that clear stand and just saying, in this context, it's not acceptable, and framing it within the context of harms, framing it within human rights, this is nothing to do with welfare benefits. It's not about immigration. It's not about othering. This is about protecting people from abuse. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Yasmin Rahman. It really some wonderfully brilliant points. One of which was, of course, on the issue of how polygamy is linked to other forms of violence and discrimination against women. And, you know, the, the essence, the solution is to actually see the human beings, not to see religion, not to have other sens sens sensitivities. You'll see that, you know, Canada is started from the human rights position and they've successfully tried to stop that and make that illegal. And that's what we need to do. Not only about polygamy, but also Sharia law, a human rights based solution. First, definitely. The insane fatwa of the week is from Iran and it is the head of the Basij, which is a disgusting militia force in Iran, uh, that has confiscated 100,000 satellite dishes and destroyed them. And of course, they're doing it for the good of society because according to him, satellite dishes 
bring corruption and divorce. That's the problem that he has. He doesn't want corruption and divorce in a society. I, that's corruption is become institutionalized by the Islamists. Yeah. And actually he's claimed, and I think he's lying, he's claimed that a million people came and handed over. Voluntarily. <laughs> their satellite dishes. Well, they're out buying another one, aren't they, after it's been destroyed. But what's interesting is that's how Bread and Roses is also distributed in Iran. And the Iranian regime has actually labeled us immoral and corrupt as well. Hmm. So It's interesting. I've been Daesh. Can, have you noticed that also Daesh and ISIS do exactly the same thing? Mm -hmm. so Saudi Arabia, all of them. They just don't want anybody to know what's going on. Slice of Life this week is from Iran and it is a movement of men wearing hijabs and it follows the unveiling movement of women in Iran on social media where women are taking photos of themselves unveiled even though it's compulsory to do so in Iran and now you've got men wearing it. I've, What's going on? Uh, first when I saw that I thought actually I'm not very much in favor of this because I am against hijab of any form, even if it's people choose it. I think that's part of the uh, human sort of succumbing to barbarity. But I actually read a couple of interviews with uh, a few of these men who have wore hijab. I was impressed because they said the reason they've done this is because, first of all, the, the, the very short period that they wore the hijab, it was so. Like, expressed and described as extremely oppressive mm -hmm. and they said we don't know how uh, women are tolerating this and the fact that people are not tolerating it and the fact that in they Iran, had to wear it for and, over 30 and years and actually they were describing that oppressive nature of hijab so I thought well done I think they've yeah, taken but a good also, I mean it looks so absurd seeing men wearing the hijab and it's sad in a way that seeing women wearing it has become so normal for us that I think it, it does take men wearing it for us to see how absurd it actually is that, you know, women's hair needs to be covered and when men do it, you sort of think, oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. Her job is oppressive. It is oppressive. So this is a wonderful movement. Well done to all the men and women who are challenging veiling laws in Iran. Anyway, we have reached the end of our program. We hope you enjoyed our program and we'll see you again at the same time and same place next week. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye. I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, 
which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.